Number three, Revelation chapter number three tonight. Revelation chapter number three. Tonight we will, Lord will, and finish up the seven churches of Revelation. Uh, tonight we'll be looking at the church of Laodicea. This is Revelation lesson number 20. It's taken us 20 lessons to get through the first three chapters. And um, so we'll see how it goes from here. But anyway, we've been studying these seven epistles in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 to the seven churches that are in Asia Minor or that were in Asia Minor. Uh, Christ, as he spoke to these churches, had both commendation for them and he also had rebuke for many of them uh, these were real and they were existing churches at the time of John's writing and uh, they were not fictitious churches they're not types of church they were churches they were real churches with real believers uh, occupying them and all but one of the churches spoken about in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 all but one received a rebuke uh, and Christ had many good things to say about these churches as well as the rebukes, but a few were simply doing worse than the others, and they were simply not living up to the expectations that Christ had for his church. Uh, Christ gave, uh, gave a pattern for a church to follow in the word of God, and there's certain uh, benchmarks, if you will, that churches are supposed to be hitting or expected to be hitting if they're going to be pleasing to the Lord. And these seven churches uh, all were a little bit different in many areas, but they had one thing in common. They were founded on the Word of God. They were founded by, uh, by a godly man. And so we want to look at the church tonight at the place called Laodicea. So look with me at verse number 14, Revelation 3, verse number 14. And the Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the beautiful and true, or excuse me, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Uh, so many believe this church called Laodicea is a representation of the churches of our modern time. Uh, with those who believe that to be true, it is said that the characteristics of this church called Laodicea reflects the same spirit of lukewarmness that exists today in many churches. Uh, in other words, people that are lukewarm in the church, these are people who do not want to fully commit. Uh, they would rather remain neutral, uh, neutral so that they don't have to take an unpopular stand on anything with regard to life and living life in a godly manner. Uh, they don't want to take a stand that would cost them friends in high places. Uh, but as we look, and as we have said before at the beginning of our study, this book, we're taking a literal approach to the text. And unless the Bible says otherwise, we believe that John was writing to a literal church in a place called Laodicea, and his message was meant for that church, Laodicea especially. Uh, specifically that doesn't mean that the principles that we learn from each of these churches uh, in here tonight at Laodicea and the principles found in the other churches at Ephesus and Smyrna and all the others that we talked about over the last several weeks does not mean that we cannot find some things that would be a help to us uh, we might find some things that we would want to stay away from uh, but this uh, this place here called Laodicea uh, had its own descriptive uh, message given by the Lord, and we don't believe that the churches should be labeled Laodicean just because we, they might have some characteristics that's found in this church. If they're not in the city of Laodicea, they're really not a Laodicean church. Uh, they can certainly share characteristics, but that's it. So as we look at Revelation 3.14, again, I want to call your attention to the first part of the verse. First part of verse 14, it says, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. This is the only letter 
of all seven of these letters that's addressed specifically to the church members. If you look back, look back with me uh, at the beginning of chapter number 2 to the church at Ephesus. Chapter 2, verse 1. Notice the wording in the verse, or in the, in the verse uh, Revelation 2, verse 1. The Bible says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. Go to the next one. Chapter 2, verse 8. Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write. Verse 12, and unto the angel of the church in Pergamos, right? And on and on we'll go, but when we come over here to the church of Laodicea, the Bible says, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Uh, this is addressed specifically to the church members. Here John writes, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. The wording suggests that this church... Uh, uh, doesn't belong to the Lord, it belongs to the Laodiceans. They say they are a church, and we'll see that here in a minute as we read a few more verses. They say that they're a church, but apparently the members of the church are out of order with the Lord. Uh, their wants and desires have taken precedent over what God wants. So the church is there, it's in name, it's called the Church of Laodicea, but in reality, it's just a, a group of people who have decided that they're going to take the leadership of the things that are going to be done and not done. And it would also indicate that the Lord felt as if he needed to speak directly to members rather than to the church corporately. Speaking to the church corporately wouldn't accomplish any, any good thing. So he decided to speak directly to the to those individuals, the believers who made up the church. Uh, there are always members in every church who desire to stay uh, with the Bible. Uh, every church has them. Uh, this often happens at great expense to those members. They're oftentimes, uh, if you're in a church and you're in a Bible-believing church, you're going to have, you know, let's say you have 100 people, you're going to have... You know, uh, just as an example, you're going to have 25 of the 100 that say, look it, if the Bible doesn't say it, I'm not doing it. If the Bible says to stay away from it, I'm staying away from it. If the Bible says to, to do something specific for the Lord, I'm going to do it. And then the other 75 in the church say, yeah, what's the, you know, what's the big deal? Yeah, we're a church. I'm here at church. I'm doing what I'm supposed to. I'm coming to church like I'm supposed to. But let's not get too uptight about all the little specifics. That is a problem in many churches today. Uh, many times those who want to stick to the word and follow the word specifically, they're ridiculed for being too narrow-minded. Uh, they might be said, to, said of them and say they hold too high of standards. They're not realistic. Carnal Christians, those that don't want to hold to the word of God, they want to show up at church, but they don't want to do anything. They don't want to serve. They don't want to, they don't want to live a separated life. Those Christians oftentimes want to attack those that are holding a more strict position of separation instead of getting right themselves. And this Laodicean church that we talk about tonight in Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, uh, by Christ's own evaluation, is a total disaster. The Lord said he would spew them out of his mouth. I don't know how much, how much more negative the Lord could, could say about this church at Laodicea. Some of the members, he said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Yet he still writes to them, and, and this is the great God that we serve. Uh, this church was a total wreck, a total disaster to the point where he wasn't even preaching to the church corporately. He was speaking only to those individuals that he felt would listen. And so he says here, uh, he said, I'll write to you and I'm going to still challenge you to get the church right. If the Lord has not returned and the, raptured our church away, we still have an opportunity to get things right. And that's not only true of a church, it's true of an individual. If you're still here and still breathing, you can still get things in your life right according to 
the Word of God. So the Bible says that, and we'll see this as we go down through, but I'll just reference it right now because it kind of fits with the narrative that we're talking about. He says, he is standing outside of this church, verse 20. And uh, he said, I'm outside the door, I'm outside the door, and I'm outside knocking. And apparently nobody was answering the door. So he's still on the outside. You know, the truth is, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is on the outside of a lot of churches. And he's been placed there by well-intentioned Christians who have decided that rather than follow the simplicity of the Word of God, they've decided to rewrite the Bible and make it say what they want it to say and allow them to do what they want it to do. You know, it's never God's, uh, it's never God's will to destroy anybody. He wants to save people. Amen? He wants his creation. He wants us as his children to succeed. He wants us to be victorious in our life. It's never his desire to destroy someone. The Bible says that he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so in verse number 14, we also see these words. Look there again with me. These things saith the amen, that's a reference to Christ, the faithful and true witness. You know what? Jesus has been that way since the beginning. He is the faithful and true witness. Uh, he's been that way since the beginning of creation. Jesus Christ has not changed. He doesn't change his ways. Uh, he doesn't feel one way today and another way tomorrow. He is consistent. He's true. He's He's uh, 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 faithful and all those things. Uh, he doesn't change his way. But you know what? The modern philosophy that we can change the Jesus of the Bible and make him something he is not or something he has never been and then teach people his new way, that is an abomination to God. You know, a lot of folks know they've heard the name Jesus, but they don't know the Jesus of the Bible. A lot of people have heard uh, the, the terminology God, but they don't know the God of the Bible. Uh, they'll say, well, you know, God would never judge anybody harshly because he's a loving God and he, you know, he loves everybody and, he, you know, he just loves you the way you are and all this stuff. Can I just tell you, that is nowhere found in the scriptures. The Bible says God hates sin. He hates them that sinneth. And so to say that he's going to give everybody a pass, no matter what they do and no matter what they say, is just not accurate according to the word. Just because the church at Laodicea was not a true witness of Christ, it didn't change who Christ was. Look with me at verse 15. Revelation 3 verse 15 says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, there it is, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So in these two verses, what do we see? Christ shows us here his abhorrence to fence sitters. Because let's face it, if you're not cold and you're not hot, that means you're somewhere in the middle, Okay. There's no other place you can be. If you're not on the left or on the right, you've got to be somewhere in the middle. And Christ says, I hate it when you sit on the fence. He says in verse uh, 15, at the end, he says, I would thou were cold or hot. He said, I'd rather have you be one or the other. Christ is saying, make a decision. You know, sometimes we just need to decide. Where we're going to live. Uh, are we going to live with Christ or are we going to live with the world? When you live with the world, you better be ready because it changes every day. The standards change. What's in changes. The way people talk change. On and on the changes go in the world. But when you stay with the Lord Jesus, it's going to be the same today, tomorrow, and for eternity. Christ is unchanging. Uh, God's word is unchanging. 
And sometimes we meet people, I don't know about you, but sometimes you meet folks claim that they're Christian and they're just simply frustrating. You know why they're frustrating? They will not commit to anything. When you're a child of God, you've got to commit. God doesn't want you half in. He wants you all in. And there's some folks who just will not make a decision to save their life. Uh, sometimes we just need to decide, are we going to live with Christ or live with the world? Sometimes we meet people who are just simply frustrating. Uh, they will not commit to anything. They will not say where they are in their spiritual life. You, you talk to them on a, on a Sunday and they'll say, hey, what, how's it going? Well, I'm not really sure. So how was your week? Well, I don't know. Uh, when you ask them a spiritual question, they'll say, nah, I don't know. I, I really don't want to commit. I'm not sure. Or I really don't want to say. Or I'd rather not get into it. You know the folks I'm talking about. When you hear those things, you can bet it's not a good situation. You say, well, some people just keep things close to the vest. Maybe. But I don't think that's everyone. When you ask them about doctrine, tell me, what do you think about this Bible doctrine? They'll say, well, I don't have an opinion. Well, what do you think the Bible means when you read this verse? Never given it much thought. But at the same time, here's what they'll say. I know I'm saved. I know I'm a child of God. And, and boy, I sure do love the Lord. You know, often these folks will stay in a church that's teaching false doctrine. And when challenged about it, here's what they'll say. They'll say, well, I know that some of the teaching isn't accurate, but I love the music and I have friends there. Well, I've got a news flash for you tonight. Your friends aren't going to get you to heaven when the day comes. If you're not right with God and you're not saved the Bible way, if you're not born again into the family of God, when the time comes you to take your last breath, your friends aren't going to help you one bit. The music that you love isn't going to help you one bit. You better get to a place where you can learn the Word of God and know what it says and what it means, what it says, and, and all those things. And often... Uh, they will stay in a church because they like those things. But I'm telling you tonight, that should not be the reason that you're in any church. You better be in a church if you uh, have uh, felt led of the Spirit of God to be there. Uh, you've come for some reason, and so that's a good thing. But uh, you want to be in a place where you're going to be told the truth. And you know what? Churches like that are becoming less and less. Instead, what they are is social clubs. Being in a social club isn't going to help you. If a social club would save you, you might as well go up to the Moose Lodge or the Elks Club or some other place. But this was the characteristic of this church, this Laodicean church. When Christ evaluated it corporately, they had multiple problems. And the church at Laodicea was a place that people could go to church, like many churches today. The, the pews oftentimes are filled with many who simply need a place to go to church. My mom told me when I was growing up as a kid, they'll say, well, I, I, you should go to church on Sunday. So you know what? There's a church. I'll go there. You know, uh, and I understand maybe they were never taught the right things or whatever, but uh, are you led to be here of God or are you simply... You need a place for your card to get punched or whatever. They don't get involved. They won't worship they, unless everything is provided. They won't fellowship. Listen, we value as a church, as a pastor, I value anyone who comes through the door. And we all should. Uh, it doesn't matter what the background is. It doesn't matter where they come from. It doesn't matter anything. It just matters that they're here and we have a responsibility as believers to tell them the truth and to love them like Christ would love them. That's our mission. 
We're not going to ask them to pay money. We're not going to ask them to, to do anything that they're not comfortable in doing and, and, and so on and so forth as a ministry or whatever. But this church at Laodicea was a, tr a church that Christ was rebuking, strongly rebuking. There was a place near Laodicea called Hierapolis. There was a hot water spring. It contained great medicinal value. People would go to the hot springs of Hierapolis and they would get into the water and they would sit and, and the water was soothing to their aching bones and all those things and had great uh, medicinal value. On the other side of Laodicea, there was a place called Colossae. It contained the purest, coldest water that you could have. It was wonderful to drink, pure and cold. Between these two places, you know what stood? Laodicea. They were smack in the middle. However, the water at Laodicea was lukewarm. It was water that would make you nauseous if you drank it. Not good. Hence, the Lord gave the typology of the church here being lukewarm. Like water, it made the Lord nauseous. Their lukewarmness in the church made the Lord nauseous. You know, God often uses what people relate to in an attempt to teach them a great spiritual principle. And so he says there in verse 15 and 16, you know, make a decision, get either warm or cold, whatever, or, or hot or cold, uh, but listen, I don't want you to stand in the middle because if you do that, he said, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Look at verse 17. He said, because thou sayest I am rich, remember that, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and poor and miserable, poor and blind, and naked. So here's an evaluation by the Lord of the church at Laodicea. Notice he says, many believe that as preachers, we should never use offensive language or we should never say anything tough or harsh or uh, that somebody might construe as harsh or uh, might not sound caring or whatever. But look what the Lord said. He said, thou art wretched. He said, you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I don't know if I've ever said that, Brother Andrew. The Lord said it. I'm not, I'm not sure how much more offensive Christ could have been about this church at Laodicea than he was right there. In this verse, we have a contrast between people, uh, between what the people of Laodicea thought and what Christ said they were. Did you notice? Look at verse 17. Because thou sayest. Christ was saying, you guys are talking a talk, but you're not walking the walk. You know what, what's true? At the end of time, it will only matter what Jesus Christ thought about us. What he thinks about it. That's all that matters. You know, people will say all of the time, you'll talk to them, you'll say, Here, here's what I think. Well, unless we're thinking about things from the same perspective as God, what we think really doesn't matter. Now, we have to live life. We have to go through life. We have to, you know, we have to, uh, you know, make decisions about what we're going to do and not do. And I understand that. And we have to live in the world. We're here and in the Christ has got us here, so we got to live. But sometimes we get well too, too wrapped up in, 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 sharing our opinions and things and what really matters is what God thinks and if you want to know what God thinks read this book from Genesis to Revelation and you'll know exactly what God thinks but he said there because thou sayest so right here we see Christ is simply responding to what the Laodiceans were saying you know sometimes it's our own lofty words that get us into trouble It's like if you work for Domino's Pizza and you say, well, our pizza is the best. Amen? You ever heard that, Brother Steve? Yeah, amen. Well, what's God think? Does God believe that to be true? 
You know what's, you know what's interesting? Our self-evaluation, when we, when we think about ourselves and we start to evaluate whether we're doing well or not, our self-evaluation rarely agrees with the Bible's evaluation. <laughs> People will say this sometimes. They'll say, are we great Christians? If we think so, you ask yourself the question, who said so? Who, who said? People will sometimes say, well, uh, that guy over there, you know that guy, my friend so-and-so, he's a great Christian guy. The question According to who? According to the Bible? By what authority and what standard is he a great Christian? Well, he's a great Christian. He loves people and, and uh, he doesn't go to church, but he loves people. He doesn't like to get into Bible discussions, but he's a great Christian. Come on. This is reality, folks. This is what some folks say. So, in reality, what are you saying? Well, I'm a great Christian, but I don't love anything this book says. This is God's love letter to us as believers. What man wouldn't reread a love letter that he received from his wife over and over and over again if he really loved her? So you ask yourself the question, by what standard are we great in these areas? There's a man who you know, and I, I, you, you've heard of him. I should say you've heard of him. You know who he is. That I would consider to be a very godly man in the New Testament. His name was Paul. Turn with me to the book of Romans. The book of Romans chapter number 7. Romans chapter number 7. And let's look and see what Paul said about what we're talking about here. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, I have need of nothing. That's what the Laodiceans were saying. But let's go over to Romans chapter 7. Look with me at verse 21. This is what the Apostle Paul said, who I believe was a great Christian man. I mean, he wrote the majority, not the majority, but he wrote a lot of the New Testament. He says here in verse 21, Romans 7, 21. I find then a law that, when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And then look at this next part. O oh, wretched man that I am, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh... The law of sin. But did you see what he said? Oh, wretched man that I am. That's what he said. Paul said, I'm a wretched man. And this is the same Paul that wrote several books of our New Testament. The Apostle Paul was a man that knew Christ personally. He had been converted in a miraculous fashion on the road to Damascus when he was going to, to persecute and kill Christians. The Lord stepped into his life on the spot and stopped him dead in his tracks and said, Paul, Paul, why, or Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I'm going to tell you more about this on Sunday. Paul made two famous statements in that little encounter. You'll hear more Sunday. The Apostle Paul was a man that knew Christ well. He had been converted. If anyone knew Christ and his likes and dislikes, it would have been Paul. He wrote about him all throughout the New Testament. But in Romans 7, 24, he said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul was surely saved on his way to heaven, on his way to great reward for his faithfulness. But in the midst of his ministry, smack in the middle of his working for the Lord, Paul gave himself a failing grade. A failing grade when it came to being a godly man. And yet we have folks today who say, well, so-and-so, there he's a great Christian. 
Loves the Lord. Doesn't want anything to do with church though. Come on. You know, many like to use these verses that we just read in Romans as an excuse to stay in sin. They'll say something like, well, you know, Paul, you know, he was a good godly man. And, you know, he said that, you know, uh, what he really wants to do, he doesn't do. And the things he doesn't want to do, he does. And so, you know, if it's good for Paul, it's good for me. But he also said not to use uh, your liberty as an occasion to sin. Paul's intent here was, he was cautioning us. Romans chapter 7, 21 through 25 is a caution from Paul not to think too highly of ourselves as believers. Every mortal man fails at something far more than he's willing to admit. Back to Revelation chapter 3. Look at verse 18. So in verse 70, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and naked, blind and naked. Verse 18, I counsel thee. God says, or the Christ says, Because you're this, here's what I'm telling you to do. I'm giving you counsel. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and right and white raiment, and thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. In verse 18, we see a very familiar word that's in the Bible in many places. It's the word gold. The word gold. It signifies something that is very precious. So let's cross-reference a, a verse. Look at Haggai chapter 2, verse 8. I'll read it for you. You don't need to turn there. Haggai chapter 2, verse 8. The Bible says, The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. You know, the truth is for us as Christians living today in 2022, here it is almost the end of the summer, August 2022, and uh, we need to come to grips with a thought process. And we need to say, hey, listen, Everything we have belongs to God. Amen. It's not ours. God's letting us use some things. The, he said in Haggai way long ago, he said, The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. And yet you got folks running around telling everybody, Buy gold, buy gold, thinking it's going to save them from the things to come. Might make you feel better, but it's not going to save you. But many times in the Bible, when the Lord speaks of precious gold, He is actually speaking about His righteousness. More valuable than gold. When we are living righteously before God, according to His word, we have something more precious than gold. Uh, the church at Laodicea was instructed to buy something that could not be gained through worldly wealth. Because look at the verse, it says... He, uh, in verse uh, 17, he said, uh, they were saying, we have need of nothing. We've got it all, man. We've got everything we need. But Jesus said, I counsel thee to buy gold tried in the fire. What is that? That's the righteousness of God. They were instructed to buy something that could not be gained through worldly wealth. You can't buy God's righteousness with any amount of money. It can only be gained one way. If you're a vilest of sinners and you have never been born again into the family of God, uh, you, can, you can be righteous like you can have the righteousness of Christ applied to your account one way. And that's by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Letting Him save your soul. That's the only way you get the righteousness of Christ applied to your account. It comes through the blood of Christ. Christ paid it all so that we could have it. We need to be telling the world about how to gain the most precious thing known to man, the righteousness of God. And this comes through biblical evangelism. The Lord says, I counsel thee. When the Lord says, I counsel, we would be well advised to listen. <laughs> you know, we listen to counsel all the time. We listen to people's thoughts on everything from 
where to shop, from what to buy, to what kind of car to drive, whether it's gas or electric, whatever this, that. We listen and we listen and we listen. Hey, listen, when the Lord tells you to do something, you better listen to that most of all. And he told the Laodiceans, I counsel thee. We are able to have the righteousness of, of Christ by being obedient and yielding ourselves to his will. But you know what? Have to, we have to do something else to, to make that happen. We've got to lay ourselves aside. Being usable vessels fit for the master's use. Here's what the problem was in the church at Laodicea. The average Laodicean believer, man or woman, would not trade what money could buy for the gold that their money could not buy. I'll say it again. The average Laodicean man or woman would not trade what their money could buy Remember, they were the ones that said, we've got everything we need. They wouldn't trade that for the goal that the Lord was counseling them to buy and that was not available with any amount of money. They were more interested in living fat, dumb, and happy. God's more concerned about his children accumulating righteousness than he is material possessions. When God evaluates churches today, what does he say? You know, picture this. The Lord looks at all kinds of churches all over our country and He goes to a large metropolis-type church in, let's just say, uh, somewhere down south, we'll say maybe uh, in Texas. And He says, wow! The Lord says, wow! Look at this beautiful campus. It stretches for acres and all the buildings are appointed with all kinds of landscaping. Oh, what a beautiful place, he says. He goes inside the building. Oh, what a beautiful sanctuary. Everything is just so. Look at the congregation. How many thousand people are in there? Probably not. That's not what the Lord's looking at. We like to think he is. God's most concerned with his children living righteously than he is about any of those things I just made reference of. You could be the poorest church on the planet and if you're living righteously, God's going to be pleased. But you could be the wealthiest church on the planet not living righteously and God says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind. What does all that mean? Wretched means to be very miserable and deep affliction. Poor and blind spiritually means they're mor morally bankrupt. They could not see what they were missing. They couldn't tell you what was moral if, they, if their life depended on it. Look at verse 19. Revelation 3.19. It says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You know, the Bible tells us in many places that if we are truly God's child, we are going to be chastened of the Lord from time to time. You know why? Because none of us are perfect. And we're going to do things we might not want to necessarily. We might not get out of bed and say, today I'm going to do something to make the Lord mad so that I can get spanked. No, but it happens. The Bible tells us that in many places, if we're truly his child, he's going to chasten us. You know the word zealous in verse 19 means to pursue after righteousness and the things that are good with great effort. You've got to put effort into living righteously. It doesn't come automatically, especially in the world we're living. It's followed by repent. You see that in verse 19? He says, many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. There's that ugly repent word again. A lot of preachers don't like that word repent. They don't like to preach about that. But guess what? If the Lord says it, and he uses it as a good word, we should use it as a good word. When we pursue righteousness in the things of God, it most likely is going to require us to change our thinking. You know, because a lot of times we're, we're not thinking straight. 
our thinking oftentimes is backwards. We get things out of sorts. So God has to chasten us. You know why he does it? Because he loves us. Parents who say they love their children, but then let them run over the top of their parental authority in truth, really don't love them at all. At least they're not acting like it. The Lord says, I'm going to chasten you if you're mine. The Bible says if you're, not, if you're without chastisement, then you're an illegitimate child. But he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. This is one of the verses that's often misapplied in the attempt to win people to Christ. It's not a soul winning verse at all. The principle, I guess, could be used. But this verse here doesn't, is not really talking about winning folks to Christ. It's a verse that is applying to the church at Laodicea in its context. Christ has been kicked out of the Laodicean church. He's saying, I will come back in if you'll just simply open the door and let me back. He's not going to kick the door in. He wants to be welcomed into the church. Many churches, I said earlier, have Christ looking uh, through the windows on the outside, and while the church is poor and wretched, they can't even tell the difference of how things might be if they would just let Christ back in. God's looking for men that will be courageous and open the door of the church and fight to make sure the Lord is freely allowed to come in, and not only once he comes in, to stay in. And there's one way we do that. Follow this book. Because I'll tell you right now, it don't matter what church you're in. If you're not following this book, Christ isn't there. He's not there. Many a man wants the Lord out of the church because it cramps his style. It cramps the worldly style of the man. Many a pastor doesn't want to preach the word of God because it cramps his worldly social club that he's building. We need every man in every church to be gatekeepers and make sure the Lord is in and the world is out. Is that too simplistic? That's God's plan. The gate of every city was a place of judgment. And there was gatekeepers. And those gatekeepers determined who would come in and who would not come in. Their job was to keep the world, uh, to keep the, the, the things that were going to hurt the city out. Gatekeeping begins at home, by the way. Godly homes where dad is the gatekeeper will produce courageous children and courageous young men that will do the same at the church once they get there. Look at verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and set and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Christ has already done the heavy lifting. He's already done the heavy lifting for us. We just simply need to be obedient and follow his plan. Follow his will for our life. Christ wants us living righteously until we see him face to face. And we will. We will one day see him face to face. He wants us doing the right things between now and then. And he wants us to be in a church that teaches and that preaches the truth of this book. And at the end of the day, that's all that matters. We need to tell more folks. We got the best kept secret in Winooski. We preach the truth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Father in heaven, thank you once again for our time tonight. We ask your blessing on your word as it's gone forth. And we thank you, Lord, for being so good to us and providing, meeting our needs. Thank you for those who've come out tonight for their faithfulness. And Father, I pray that you would just 
Give us safety and mercy as we journey home, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen.